Hi everyone and welcome back to the George Collection. I'm Rachel Wrightside Blonde. Today I'm going to bring you the April 1999 issue of George with none other than Garth Brooks on the cover. Garth Brooks has been in the news a lot lately. Please welcome Garth Brooks to perform. Garth Brooks Amazing is taking Brooks. incoming from all sides. Amazing. Some of his conservative fans are irate that he would perform at Joe Biden's inauguration after he refused to do the same for Donald Trump four years ago. Brooks said a scheduling conflict prevented him from singing for Trump. Of his performance Wednesday, one fan wrote, very disappointing. Another said, you lost me, Garth, and this. We can play cancel culture too. Brooks said he was not taking sides. This is not a political statement. This is a statement of unity. He's also being criticized for over exuberance. After his performance, he shook hands with President Biden without a mask. Same with the vice president. Even hugged President Obama, Clinton and Bush. A big pandemic no-no. Brooks says he was tested repeatedly in the days leading up to the inauguration. After saying he will serve every brand of beer, including Bud Light, at his new bar in Nashville. And if you're not sure why that's actually news, it should be on a national broadcast that a bar is going to serve Bud Light. Well, it's because of the controversy, the sort of culture war controversy about it. That's after Bud Light partnered with a trans influencer for a social media ad campaign back in April. Here's what Brooks had to say. I'm a bar owner now. Are we going to have the most popular beers in the thing? Yes. Here's the deal, man. If you want to come to friends and local places, come in. Come in with love. Come in with tolerance, patience. Come in with an open mind. And uh, it's cool. The backlash that Garth Brooks is seeing right now has been pretty harsh online. I actually just looked at his social media pages right before you came to me. And the backlash has gotten even more intense. People saying that they're just done with him. People saying that they may even burn the merchandise they do have from him. Certainly saying they're not going to buy any more. This issue is very significant because it's from April of 1999. And we all know what happened in July of 1999. And that is that John Kennedy Jr.'s plane crash happened. Earlier this year in an interview, Donald Trump mentioned that John Kennedy Jr. was thinking about running for Senate. Uh, I got to know John Kennedy very well. John, John, uh, fantastic. I think he would have been president. I think he was, you know, he was selling, he had a magazine named George and he was going to be selling that. He wanted to get out. His mother wanted him to go into politics really strongly. He wanted to be an actor. He would have, uh, he was getting ready to, I think he would have run for the Senate from New York or someplace, but probably New York, and wanted to do it, and he was, he was all set for that. We all know who ended up winning that Senate seat, and that is Hillary Clinton. What's interesting is that exactly three months prior to that plane crash, John Kennedy Jr. put this on the cover of his magazine. I find it interesting this was on the cover just three months prior to the plane crash, and with none other than Mr. Garth Brooks. Before we get to the actual interview and article with Garth Brooks, I wanted to point out a picture on the editor's letter page with John Kennedy Jr. The caption says, Chatting with Garth Brooks, sans black hat, in February. To see the country music superstar's new look, turn to the interview on page 70. So let's do that. Given all the recent controversy surrounding Garth Brooks, I had to choose this issue to go through today. And let's get into the article. The title is The World According to Garth. With songs of love and liberation, he reinvented country music and became the most popular entertainer of our time. Now Garth Brooks is releasing a breakthrough album and hurtling new fences. John Kennedy talks with America's most fascinating performer about John Wayne, Martin Luther King Jr., and what it means to be a hero. The article starts, At one time, the phenomenon known as Garth was just plain old Garth Brooks. Raised in the small town of Yukon, Oklahoma, along Route 66, he was the last of six kids of an oil company worker and a homemaker. He attended college on an athletic scholarship and graduated with a degree in advertising. But Brooks discovered his true calling while playing country music in honky-tonk bars around the college town of Stillwater, Oklahoma. Eventually Garth, that's how he refers to his multi-million dollar enterprise, became the best-selling solo act in music history. 
more successful than Elvis, and he'll soon surpass the Beatles in the number of albums sold in the U.S., 89 million and counting. Brooks is an American icon who transcends the erroneous stereotypes that often accompany the Nashville sound. Country music is a uniquely American creation rooted in the land and in the life experiences of those who play it. But as the South and the West boomed in the past decade, so did country music. The Sun Belt's rise fostered a new suburban middle class economically linked to its cities, yet still emotionally connected to the countryside. Many people wrongly assume that country music's popularity is linked with the ascension of a new brand of hard-nosed Southern conservatism embodied in the politics of such suburban Republican politicians as Trent Lott of Mississippi and Tom DeLay of Texas. But the music and the creed do often draw from the same well, love of country, God, family, and simple values. Brooks's songs have tapped into those values, but he has also changed them, giving them broader appeal. Employing hip production values and canny marketing steeped in American imagery, he recreated country music. During the last eight years, six of his albums have topped the pop charts, an unprecedented achievement for a country music star. Brooks has dared to take country music beyond its borders, breaking concert records in every major northeastern city and attracting an estimated 500,000 jaded New Yorkers to the Central Park Garth Fest in 1997. He not only lassoed vast new audiences, but also broke new ground by writing socially provocative lyrics. His video for the song, The Thunder Rolls, drew howls of controversy for its explicit depiction of domestic violence. His song, We Shall Be Free, was wildly interpreted as a show of tolerance for gay rights. And in the wake of the Los Angeles riots, Brooks donated $1 million to help rebuild the devastated South Central neighborhood, hardly a place whose residents buy a whole lot of country music. Recently, country music's fortunes have been flagging, but Brooks isn't about to get left behind. He's currently working on a daring project about a fictitious pop star whose early death is the only dignified escape from his crushing fame. And this spring, he will release an album in which he sings rather ungarth like songs in the guise of this edgy rock and roller. Remember Chris Gaines? He's also planning to produce a movie tentatively called The Lamb about this hard living character's life and tragic death. And Brooks is living yet another American dream. He's trying to play professional baseball. In February, he went to the San Diego Padres spring training game to try out for the team. At 37, he's a little older than his teammates, but he can still hit the long ball. Not bad for a kid from Yukon. John Kennedy asks, throughout your career, you've made use of American symbolism, flags on your album covers, cowboy imagery. Now you're a baseball player. Is that about the music or are you making a broader statement about the country? Garth replies, I can only be what I am, American and God-fearing. I know God is the reason for all things good. When I go to Europe or play in Australia, for instance, the first thing out of my mouth is, people, I'm telling you, I'm the most American guy you've ever seen, so I'm not going to try to fool you and fit in here. I'm just going to play you my music, and if you guys accept it, thank God. And if you guys don't, thank you for your time, and I'll get out of your way. John Kennedy asks, well, what's the most American thing about you? And Garth replies, squareness, I'm very square. I'm very patriotic. I believe I owe this country for what I'm getting to do. Like when the Persian Gulf War broke out, I called a recruiter and asks, what are we doing? Are we signing up? John replies, you are way too old. Garth says, I know, but that's my gig. I love this country. I love what it stands for and I love what it could be. John asks, who were your heroes growing up, your influences? And Garth replies, my three heroes are John Wayne, John F. Kennedy, and Martin Luther King Jr. But I want to be real honest with you, and please forgive me if at any time during this answer you are offended. John said, of course. Garth says, if we had the press back then that we have today, I'm not sure if those three guys would be heroes to us. We all have skeletons. In fact, that's how we learn to become heroes, by the mistakes we make. I wish the press would allow people to be human so our heroes could emerge, because I'm not sure we've had a hero in a long, long time. John Kennedy asked, what qualities do heroes share that make them icons? And Garth replied, they all grasped the moment. They didn't say, sure, I'll do that, but you're gonna have to pay me for taking the chance. It's more like, screw it. Gotta go out there and swing in the wind and risk failure, risk embarrassment, and just do it. John asked, so the willingness to risk it all is what people are drawn to? And Garth replied, all I know is what makes a person a hero to me. Michael Jordan is one of the greatest athletes of our time, and I respect him for that. But he got so big and everybody loved him so much that suddenly he was no longer the underdog. 
So when he decided to play baseball, when he took off his crown and put it on the table so he could follow something else he believed in, my respect and love and admiration for him just went through the roof. But then that negative Sports Illustrated article on him came out. I'd love to take that article and shove it up Sports Illustrated's ass as far as I can get it for condemning someone for taking a chance. I love Michael Jordan more for his short career as a baseball player than for his entire career in basketball. John Kennedy asked, in conjunction with your new album, you're producing a film about a character who follows that heroic arc, an audacious rise to pop superstardom, then his murder at the height of his powers. This is a big gamble for you, isn't it? Garth replies, hopefully the people who follow my music won't think, man, this guy's going off the deep end. Instead, they'll understand that I'm still the same music person I always was. It's just that now I'm developing a new character who I'm taking very seriously. A character that will be inventing his own music as well. John says, like an alter ego? And Garth says, right. I want to pull together something totally different here. Even though I'm playing a different person, I'm hoping that if you know Garth and you're a fan of Garth, you'll see Garth in the character. He's there. I hope that happens with the music too. That even though it might not be the sound you're used to hearing, something in it grooves you and takes you back to the roots of Garth music from the past. John asked, how much does premature death have to do with your notion of heroism? Are people heroic only if they don't have a whole life to mess it up? Garth replies, sure. Just take a look at any of your big heroes. Early death seems to be a common denominator. Elvis Presley, John Lennon, James Dean, Marilyn Monroe, Kennedy, King, all these guys. Of course, other guys live long lives. Joe DiMaggio, Roy Rogers, Gene Autry. So we do have heroes who stood the test of time, but in the long run, and I've always said this about myself, Success is simply about how long you can keep people from knowing you're a failure. John asked, People have long equated a society's musical taste with what's going on politically. Does country music do better when the times are more conservative? Garth replies, Sure. A lot of it is a reflection of what people are relating to at the time. John asked, Is it ever tempting to include a political message in your work? And Garth replies, When you know you're going to get three minutes in front of the nation with a new song, it once again comes down to walking that fine line. And if I come out with something serious every time, I'm bound to hear, here's another new single from Garth Brooks. Wonder what he's going to bitch about this time. John asked, how do you mix it up? Garth replies, sometimes you send a song down the pike that lets people say, hey man, that's cool, turn it up. I don't know what the words are, but I don't care, turn it up. And that might set up the next song, which maybe says, we're all free to worship, we shall be free. Then you can go back to something that talks more about love. Then move on to a song about problems we have with, say, the welfare system. John says, in 1991, your Thunder Rolls video got a lot of people talking about domestic violence. It created a real controversy and indirectly helped launch your career. In the end, was it good politics or good art? Garth replied, I thought it was just good art, but after the song hit, we got banned. Then the phone began ringing off the wall. I picked it up one day, all pissed and hurt and not knowing what to think. And on the other end, this guy's laughing his ass off. It's Jimmy Bowen, the head of Capital Nashville. And I said, Jimmy, what are you so happy about? He says, you're going to be a household name by the end of the week. Sure enough, No Fences went on to sell 16 million units. John said, in We Shall Be Free, you made a statement on behalf of gay rights. Garth said, it's interesting. The lyric from that song that got all the attention was simply, when we're free to love anyone we choose. What's odd is that nobody assumed it could mean interracial marriages or interfaith marriages. They immediately went straight to the homosexual thing. Why did they go there? I don't know, but again, it is all about being honest. I can't see love being a bad thing. Lust is different. But if you're in love, you've got to follow your heart and trust that God will explain to us why we sometimes fall in love with people of the same sex. Judgment day is coming, and I ain't going to be the one standing over people up there. John said, you've spoken candidly about your own failures in your family, marriage, career, and people's willingness to accept those mistakes. So much of the impeachment drama was about the public's acceptance of Clinton's failures. Did that resonate with you? Garth said, I don't know. I kind of turned my back on it all and got lost in the McGuire-Sosa home run race. I'm sorry, man, but I just got to think the whole thing was a big crock of shit. John said, how so? Garth said, in my opinion, the Republicans wanted to find something, they found something, and they got even. I don't know if you've ever done this in your life where you pick a fight, then all of a sudden in the middle of the fight, you realize it's getting worse than you thought it would get, and now you really want to get out of it. It's like, holy shit. I think everybody knows it shouldn't have gone this far. John said, you sound disenchanted with that world. Garth said, well, I could sit here and armchair quarterback all day, 
But we've got to remember we're talking about people who take these jobs knowing they're the toughest jobs in the world. The system we have might have worked, must have worked at some time, but the truth is that time has moved on. We're going to have to get rid of the Democratic Republican system because everyone votes for things because they're Democratic or Republican, black or white, gay or straight, not because they're right or wrong. Face it, we've got people making a career out of politics. Their job is to protect their families, like anyone else who makes money in a family. So when it comes to voting, are they going to vote the way people who control the voting percentages want them to vote, or because what they believe is right or wrong? Some guy who's been in there four terms has a house, a car, kids in college. Is he going to risk losing that seat over a vote? John asked, do you have any party affiliation that you want to talk about? And Garth replies, I'm non-denominational, man. John asked, have you ever thought about going into public life after your music career? Garth said, you mean into politics? Yes, John said. No offense to your family traditions, pal, but I don't think they would let me live if I got in there. The system would have to change, and I really don't think they'd let me get away with it. John said, with what? Garth said, well, first, I would make sure we invested in education and defense. We are the peacekeepers of the world, and the more we educate our children and the children of the world, Hopefully the less we'll need the peacekeepers in the future. We'll resort to thinking before we resort to fists. Another thing is God. There are some traditions this country was built on, and one of them is in God we trust. You can't take God out of the schools. I understand about the separation of religion and state, but tell me this. Why do we keep God in school only on the things that are convenient for us? Why does our federal government declare Christmas and Easter holidays? Why does our money have in God we trust on it? Why is it everybody wants to get rid of God when it concerns the voting thing, but never when it involves the fun stuff like vacations and holidays? So yes, this country was built on certain traditions that should absolutely stay in. God is what this country is built on. and Without God, I don't think we're a nation. John said, by the time this interview is published, you may have quit your day job for a late blooming baseball career. What's that all about? Garth replies, I'm standing on the threshold of one of the biggest risks I'll probably ever take in my life. I'm about to sign with the Padres to play baseball this year. We'll have to wait to see if it goes past spring training, if I make the cut. But talk about opening yourself up. And John said, why did you pick the Padres? Garth said, I went to spring training just to get in a cage and take batting practice and I fell in love with the team. The Padres coaching staff was very sweet. They came to watch me practice at a single A farm team in Billings, Montana and a triple A farm team in Vegas. I had exhibition scouts and all that. Eventually, they invited me to play. I was number 57 on a 57-man roster. John said, Would you classify the country music fan as a special breed? And Garth said, The thing about country music fans is that they'll walk up to you and tell you flat out, Hey man, I just love that last song you did. Or hey man, what in the hell was that all about? They never mean to offend you. They're just being honest. And even though the honesty is sometimes a little more than you want when the day is over, you would much rather have that than somebody who's just feeding you a line. John said, do you have a sense of who your fans are? And Garth replies, I've got to believe that we're all more alike than we want to admit. All I can do is remember what I was doing all the way up until 1989, when my wife's and my combined salary was 10 grand a year. I worked on street crews, made pizza, sold shoes, roofed, laid water meters, cleaned out sewers. I did all that stuff. You can never forget what it was like working all day for somebody else, doing something that your name really wasn't on. Just so when Friday and Saturday came along, you'd have the money to go out and do the things you wanted to do. That's what I think my fans are doing. So my gig is, while they're at work with that radio on, I've got three minutes to take them away from where they are and hopefully make them think, yeah, I'm going to talk to my kid tonight about that, or yeah, I'm going to call my dad and tell him I love him. And John said, the more you move away from that old life, does it become harder to remember where you came from? And Garth said, yeah, you lose touch with reality. This ain't the real world. My dad reminds me of that each time I see him. He'll say, you realize you're not living in the real world, right? I love the man to death and he loves me to death, so he cares enough to ask me that every time. And it's like, yeah, dad, you're exactly right. I ain't. I am not living in the real world. And as long as my answer pleases him, he's fine. He pats me on the back and tells me to keep fighting the good fight. I don't know what was playing on your radios in the 1990s, but there was a lot of Garth Brooks playing on ours here in Iowa and probably across the country. I knew and probably still know all of the lyrics of just about every Garth Brooks song. I even had his CD, the Chris Gaines CD, probably still have it somewhere. It's interesting that he's popped up in the news lately, both with two years ago, the Biden inauguration and now the Bud Light scandal with his new bar opening up. Knowing what we know now with 
music stars when they reach certain levels of superstardom, what might happen. We hope that didn't happen in this case, but it certainly seems like it could be a potential. It was interesting for me to read the 1999 responses of Garth Brooks and to see how this has played out in 2023 for him to take such hard stances in the political arena and also with social justice issues with a majority of Americans and especially the majority of country music listeners are not in agreement with his stances. Reading through this article, there were quite a few phrases that caught my attention and maybe they caught your attention too as to who Garth really was and what his hopes and dreams really were back then. So what really are Garth's intentions for the country? What do you think? Put them in the comments. That does it for this episode of The George Collection. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week and I'll see you next time. Magazine, George, which is a hoot of a magazine. I thought you were a lawyer. I was. What happened? Well, we uh, we decided, I mean, actually taking a cue from, from folks like yourself and you around the 1992 election, that, that there was an opportunity here to uh, change the definition of a political magazine. Uh, certainly the way Americans were uh, accessing information about politics and politicians was changing. Uh, candidates were appearing on late night talk shows, on talk radio, on sitcoms, uh, and there was a, a kind of a leveling process, and while the rest of media clearly had caught up with that, we felt that political magazines, per se, hadn't. Your mother was a hell of an editor at Doubleday. That's what I hear. Would she have liked George? I think she would have.